Thank you for joining us for part two of our series in tracking vegetation phenology with remote sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and I again will be joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez. For this training, um, we have three one hour sessions. We had our first session last week on June 30th. Today is July 7th, and then we'll have a final session on July 14th, a week from today. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here. This includes a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and um, finally, a link to the Google form, which will be available next week for the homework submission. There's only one prerequisite for this course, and it's the fundamentals of remote sensing or equivalent knowledge. After each session, we will have question and answer portion, and feel free to type your questions into the chat box along the way, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the question and answers on the website after the training. If we don't get to a question, you can also email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses shown at the bottom here. As I mentioned, we will have one follow on homework. Um, to receive credit for the homework, you must submit all the answers via Google Forms um, by the deadline, which will be Thursday, July 28th. So that will be two weeks after the last session. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. So as we discussed last week, here's a general outline of the course. And today we're going to be talking about different scales of phenology and some national networks that we have here in the United States for monitoring phenology. By the end of the presentation, you will be able to recall how data can be acquired at various scales to provide a holistic understanding of phenology. You'll be able to identify the various data collecting and sharing networks, such as the National Phenology Network, the National Ecological Observation Network, or NEON, and Phenocam. You'll be able to access and analyze phenology data from these networks and really become engaged in regional data collection. So let's start off today with a discussion of the various scales of phenology. During the first session, we discussed large scale or landscape processes of phenology. However, it's really important to observe phenological processes on a variety of scales, which makes regional and national ground-based data and knowledge vital to validate and connect remotely sensed data. As you can see here, phenology can be observed and measured at multiple levels of biological and geographical organization. Information from each of these levels provides fundamental knowledge about the patterns and processes in nature. Phenological studies can inform us about the timing and duration of resource availability in ecological communities. Data from long-term field research designed to assess how various landscape changes, such as temperature and precipitation, are affecting key conditions, processes, and species are important for providing the information to managers need, that need um, this information regarding current climate-related changes and for improving models to predict future changes with greater certainty. Scientific capabilities and efficiencies for conducting long-term studies integrated across disciplines and scales have really continued to improve with satellite, airborne, and ground-based sensors that allow co-mingled measurements of biotic and abiotic variables, including in locations that are remote or expensive to access. As a result, collecting and analyzing data using a combination of novel and more established technologies present new opportunities to provide resource managers information they need regarding these climate-driven ecological changes at meaningful scales. 
So the real key here to creating a holistic picture of the timing of ecological events is to connect these various types of measurements. From scientists and community members visiting the field and making note of things like open flowers and ripe fruit, to the weather stations collecting temperature and precipitation, along with near surface remote sensing towers collecting data like PAR that we mentioned last week, to the aircraft and satellites collecting data such as elevation and ecosystem structure and vegetation reflectance. Additionally, many of these same parameters are scales, and therefore we can ground validate remote sensing data to identify regional or global patterns. So if the flowering the citizen scientists are viewing on the ground corresponds to changes in the vegetation reflectivity as seen from a satellite like Landsat, like Landsat, these systems can help validate one another. So it's all about this multi-level approach and the connections of these data. And a big part of that is ground validation of all the satellite data and products that we discussed a lot last week. So the focus for today will really be to introduce you to these networks and some of the available tools um, that you can use to engage citizens, the researchers, as well as decision makers. Given the need for this multi-scalar analysis, we will first introduce you to the US National Phenology Network, or NPN. And I did wanna make a note here that throughout this uh, lesson for today, we're really going to focus on a lot of um, networks for the U.S. in particular. Um, and there will be one that has sites globally, but I did want to mention that it, it's, it's really a U.S. focus. And I know that we have a global audience, but um, there are similar networks available in other places. Um, so I just wanted to, to make note of that prior to, to moving on to describe some of these networks. The National Phenology Network, or NPN, is a national scale monitoring and research initiative focused on collecting, organizing, and delivering phenological data, information, and forecasts to support management and decision making, to really advance the science of phenology, and to promote understanding and appreciation for phenology by a wide range of audiences. The USA NPN consists of a national coordinating office where there are thousands of volunteer observers and many partners, including research scientists, research managers, educators, policymakers. Anyone who participates in Nature's Notebook, which we'll talk about soon, or collaborates with the coordinating office staff to advance the science of phenology or to inform decisions is considered part of the NPN. The primary goal of the NPN is to create a standardized place for people to collect and share phenology information and data. And this has been going on over the last 10 years or so. They also have education and outreach activities. This provides opportunities for people uh, at all ages to engage with citizen science projects and to understand how species are responding to environmental variation and climate change. These data are also available to scientists, research managers, and the public. So um, the, the data can be used for a variety of applications. Finally, the NPN has an extensive catalog of educational resources um, that can be used by teachers, park staff, and extension program educators. And these are really fantastic and they help communicate information about things like climate change, and how these citizen science programs are contributing to a larger community of scientific research. Oh. So the way that NPN meets these objectives is through Nature's Notebook, which is a citizen science program, where scientists and non-scientists alike are collecting phenology observations on hundreds of species of plants and animals, including things like birds, frogs, mammals, insects, and fish. Um, nature's notebook uh, can be directly used to support research. 
The phonology observations collected through the Nature's Notebook are maintained in the NPN's National Phonology Database, um, which we'll talk about, and um, are made freely available for query, visualization, and download on the NPN website. So I've included a few um, really uh, interesting statistics about Nature's Notebook. Um, so there are over 13,000 active observers and over 11,000 sites. There are more than 20 million records. And through the, these data, there have been over 60 publications produced, as well as um, 68 different data products. And we'll talk about some of those products as well. These data are collected all across the United States. And this figure shows the distribution of measurements from 2009 to 2019. Here there are over 2.5 million phonology data records collected on more than 5,000 individual plants. And these are observed also at um, some of the NEON sites, which we'll talk about later, um, that were collected um, and NEON data were collected between 2013 and 2019. So they can be used in conjunction with these um, on the ground phonology observations. And these data are reflected in the map um, that you can see here um, and are available for visualization and download on the website. This is an example of what the protocols look like for monitoring the phenophase of various plants and animals. You can sign up to be a part of this community online and take weekly measurements from your smartphone. It's recommended that as a contributor, you conduct long-term monitoring of the same individual plants or animals. And the uh, identification of no observations is also really important. So if you are using this tool and you don't see anything changing, um, that's a really useful observation for all the scientists out there as well. Um, this way, anyone who is a user of the data can see the phenophases and get a clear picture of the ecological processes. That first yes is really key. So this is the first time in the season um, that you see these shifts advancing more quickly. Um, so it can be the first yes of um, breaking leaf buds or the first yes of colored leaves. And um, that's really important to the scientists who are using these data. And it's a really easy approachable process that you can use directly on your phone here. This is an example of what you can track on Nature's Notebook, uh, like the phenophases from a deciduous plant, where you can see that many of these phases are overlapping, such as flowers or flower buds at the same time as fruit. And there are also many regional campaigns focused on a particular species or ecosystem dynamic, such as changes in food sources for pollinators like monarch butterflies, cactus flowering events for bat food, and green wave identification. During session three, we are going to um, discuss the green wave example in more detail, so stay tuned for that. You can also imagine how this dense network of data contributes to regional modeling and visualization of phenological changes. The NPN also catalogs all of this information and other data collected by scientists into their phonology observation portal. And that's what you can see here. You can download customized data sets of observational data from the National Phonology Database, which includes all of the data collected via Nature's Notebook that we just talked about. So for example, you could look at historical lilac and honeysuckle data from 1955 to present. Filters are available to specify dates, regions, species, and phenophases of interest. Here you can filter by status and intensity, which is the phenophase status records of yes for presence or no for absence of the phenophase, as well as information about the degree to which the phenophase was expressed. You can also include individual phenometrics like estimates of the dates of phenophase onset and ends for individual plants and for animal species at a um, user-defined site and time period. 
once you filter your search, you can download a CSV file of all the data. Um, and we'll discuss some of this later. The NPN also has this visualization tool to investigate the data directly on the website, uh, potentially prior to downloading data. Within the tool, you can create and view maps, create scatter plots, view activity curves, calendars, and time series. The new Phenology visual Visualization tool that was just made available of Jan in January of this year provides an easier way to explore Phenology data and maps. New features include grouping data by higher taxonomic group, such as genus, family, and order, and the ability to move more than two years on activity curves and calendars, and a little bit more flexibility in the ability to select locations. With this new version of the tool, you can access the data through these seasonal stories, which guide you through several examples of ways you can visualize the data, such as how fast it is warming up this year, which allows you to make graphs of things like accumulated growing degree days, or how much accumulated heat we've observed thus far in the year. You can also view graphs of spring onset, which is a really major question for phenology. The Data Explorer lets you dive deep into the observational plant and animal data, as well as the NPN's phenology maps, where you're taken directly to the map interface if you already know um, what you're interested in viewing. So with the time series option, you can answer the question, how fast is it warming up this year where I live? So here what you can see is a time series of growing degree days for Oakland, California, which is where I live. So this graph shows the daily accumulation of heat, also known as growing degree days, for the current year in Oakland and compares it to previous years of heat accumulation. The long-term average of accumulation over the period of uh, 1981 to 2013 is shown in black, the current year is shown in blue, and the prior year is shown in orange. You can also see the prediction uh, for accumulated accumulation over the next six days that's shown in red at the very um, end of the figure. Heat accumulation is a metric of climate that's a common driver of phenological activity. Many species respond by leafing, flowering, or emerging at particular heat accumulation thresholds. This graph can show you whether heat is accumulating faster than normal where you live, which may mean earlier than average signs of phenological activity. If there is a particular heat accumulation threshold that is of interest to you, you can set the threshold in the features menu to see if it has been met, and if so, when it was met. In addition, you can modify the degree-based temperature for the accumulation curve and the location in the layer and or point menu. You can also view a calendar that identifies the time period of events for a particular species or family or class, whichever you choose. In this example, we have chosen red maple with the top two panels in blue indicating the time period of breaking buds from 2015 along the top and 2016 in the second panel. In the bottom two panels, you can see the differences in open flowers from 2015 and 2016. So for example, you can see that flowers appeared earlier for the red maple in 2016 compared to 2015. And you can go back all the way to 1900 if there are data for that particular um, species. One of my personal favorites are the gridded maps as these incorporate data from many sources and could be compared additionally to remote sensing data. So if you're interested in the question, where did spring arrive early this year? This map shows where spring leaf out arrived earlier or later this year compared to the long-term average of 1981 to 2010. The map is based on an integrative model that predicts the start of spring, also called the spring indices. This model was developed using a long-term data set of lilacs and honeysuckles 
and has been identified as a climate change indicator by the U.S. Global Change Research Program. This shows locations that are red are earlier than average for the start of spring leaf out, and locations that are blue are later than average. Earlier spring leaf out may result in greater risk of frost damage to plants that are beginning to leaf out or flowering before um, the final winter frost. You can also change the map display by changing the layer category in the map menu. Within the spring indices category, you can either display the leaf or the bloom model and view annual historical maps and current year status and anomaly maps like this one. So this is a really telling picture of how spring is coming earlier in the South, the mid-Atlantic, and much of the Western and Southwestern United States. This was taken on June 2nd and shows data up to March 30th. So there's a short latency for the generation of the maps. These data are displayed at daily temporal resolution at 2.5 kilometer spatial resolution. And they are generated from data um, based on data from NOAA and PRISM. This layer shows the number of accumulated growing degree days for every day of the year. These long-term averages were created by averaging the accumulated growing degree day values for the same day of the year over the span of also 1981 to 2010. So that climatological average. The accumulated growing degree days, our averages are calculated in Fahrenheit with a 32 degree base. And the accumulations begin from January 1st. So what you can see here are the anomalies for this year on June 2nd compared to the climatological average with some similar patterns um, that we observed in the last map as well. And finally, you can view pheno forecasts through the visualization tool. Here you can see the forecast for the Magnolia scale, which is a um, pest that's native to the Eastern United States that affects magnolia and tulip trees. They cause stress to their host trees by removing sap, which can lead to yellowing leaves, twig dieback, and even death. The colors from purple to yellow identify the number of growing degree days that it will take to see crawlers in two to three weeks in blues and purples up to emergence of this pest in yellow. The NPN has some amazing resources at your disposal. And on the left here is a link to a great webinar on the visualization tool that provides key demonstrations. So I do encourage you all to check that out if you're interested in um, taking a look at those um, features. You can also connect with the NPN through their newsletter and their social media. You can become a contributor to Nature's Notebook and access their um, support group here as well. I also wanted to, to mention a community that's connected to NPN um, called the Indigenous Phenology Network. This is a grassroots organization where participants are interested in understanding phenology on lands and species of importance to Native people. The group is focused on building relationships, ensuring benefit to Indigenous communities, and integrating Indigenous and Western knowledge systems. It's a very active group and they connect under a um, established doctrine. And I've outlined a few of those points from the doctrine here, um, but I do encourage um, you all to engage with this network as well. And it's tied to the National Phenology Network. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to another effort that's connected to NPN. Um, that you all may have heard of called the National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON. The NEON program collects plant phenology data, that is, observations about the timing of biological events at terrestrial and aquatic field sites across the U.S. Through a partnership with the NPN, these data are available through the um, data access and visualization tools that we just discussed. More than 2.6 million neon plant phenology data records 
representing observations of over 5,000 individual plants at 47 neon field sites have already been ingested into that database that we discussed. The data integration project allows scientists to conduct combined analysis of NEON and NPN data. The collaboration expands the scope of data available through the NPN and makes NEON phenology data more accessible to the science community. Scientists working on the NEON program collect data at terrestrial sites as well as freshwater aquatic sites at various um, spatial and temporal scales. The sites are strategically placed within 20 ecoclimatic domains to ensure statistically robust representation of ecological, physical, and biological variability. Where logistically possible, the terrestrial and aquatic sites are co-located to capture connections across atmospheric, terrestrial, and aquatic systems. Automated instruments observational sampling and airborne remote sensing methods are used to gather the data. The collection methods are standardized and integrated to ensure comparability of ecological patterns and processes between the NEON sites across time. Anyone can access the observatory's open data, archive samples, supporting protocols, and documentation and um, the links to these things are provided here in the slides, so do take advantage of that. Training is also available to help scientists to learn how to work with these data, um, including free online um, training tutorials. So do please take a look at those if you're interested in using the data. The NEON program has established a network of 20 core sites that are selected to characterize wildland environments over the 30-year lifetime of the observatory. Additional relocatable sites are designed to move multiple times during the lifetime of the observatory and are selected to gather data that enables investigations of specific research areas, such as climate gradients or dust transport. The core site would also act as a reference point to study the effects of human-driven changes um, across the 30 years, as well as data from NEON's airborne observation platform, which we'll discuss shortly. There are a total of 81 aquatic and terrestrial field sites over these 20 ecosystems. As I mentioned, anyone can access NEON data products as they become available. All of the digital NEON data products are available through the NEON data portal, um, which we'll talk a little bit about soon. Um, types of digital data include sensor, um, sampling, remote sensing data, and their associated metadata, as well as the um, sampling protocols and procedures. Biological specimens are being collected, imaged, and cataloged and stored. Digital images and physical specimens will also be available in the future. Currently, right now, um, only the soils data are available and um, can be accessed via a request submitted by a researcher. These resources cover five key, key data themes, atmosphere, biogeochemistry, ecohydrology, land use, and land cover processes, and organism population and communities. NEON deploys automated instruments to collect meteorological, soil, phenological, surface water, and groundwater data at each of the field sites. Data are collected continuously, capture patterns and cycles across various time periods, ranging from seconds to years. NEON calibrates and quality checks the sensors to, measure, to minimize the measurement errors and to maximize the quality of the collected data. The data collected by the automated instrument systems are standardized, but the systems do vary from site to site. At each of the terrestrial sites, there is a micrometeorological tower, a soil sensor array, precipitation gauges, and two phenocams. And we'll talk a little bit about phenocams later. 
At the aquatic sites, there are surface water quality and depth measurements, groundwater, precipitation, as well as phenocamp data. Where logistically possible, I mentioned that NEON collects aquatic sites, um, NEON collects data at aquatic and terrestrial sites together. Sampling focuses on sentinel taxa, which are sensitive organisms that indicate the health of the ecosystem and provide data relevant to public health. Changes in community dynamics of sentinel taxa affect the ecological process, such as um, disease transmission rates, agricultural pest control, and ecosystem structure and function. And there are many different observations collected, so I do encourage you to visit the NEON website if you're interested in specific types of data. The NEON Airborne Observation Platform is an array of instruments installed into a light aircraft to collect high resolution remote sensing data at low altitude. Airborne remote sensing surveys are conducted over NEON field sites during peak greenness to collect quantitative information of each field site on land cover and changes to ecological structure and chemistry. And this includes the presence and the effects of invasive species. The aircraft collects gridded LIDAR data at one meter spatial resolution and digital photography at 0.25 meter resolution. Each year, NEON surveys about 75% 70 of their, their field sites, and they do this on a rotating basis. The NEON data portal, shown here, is the access point for all the freely available NEON data. There are many different ways to explore and analyze data from the, those 81 sites across the US. So you can use the search bar if you know what you're looking for. You can also search by um, a word or phrase of your choice, including any keyword, product name, site ID, or domain. Uh, phrases that have more than one word should be surrounded by quotes. So for example, if you're looking for biological temperature, you would want to put those around, um, put quotes around that phrase. Um, once you uh, do a search and click enter, the search will take you to a predefined um, filtered selection of data. You can also use the Explore Data Products page um, and just go directly there if you, if you know what you're looking for as well. You can also search for data by a specific site. If you scroll down the page um, on this map, you can see the site location. Here, I've clicked on one of the core sites at Yellowstone National Park. And you can see some of the initial details, and then you can explore the data directly. So if you click on the site details, you'll be taken to a page that looks like this. You can see um, there are data related to mosquitoes and various gridded data. Then if you click on browse data, you'll be taken to the explore data product products page for that specific site. So along the left panel is where you can modify your selections. And if you scroll down, you would see that the Yellowstone, Yellowstone site is selected as the filter. So we're only looking at data from the Yellowstone site here. You can see that there are 37 products. And for each available product listed, like Albedo that's shown here, there are dates of availability and the option to download those data directly. If you scroll down the list of data available for this Yellowstone site, you can find data relevant to phenology, such as FPAR. If you click on the product details, you can get the description and an outline of the dates um, that these data are available. The description will say something like this. The fraction of incident photosynthetically active radiation from 400 to 700 nanometers absorbed by the green elements of the vegetation canopy. And um, this is a mosaic FPAR level two product that um, is obtained on a spatially uniform grid at one meter spatial resolution and is provided um, at one kilometer by one kilometer tiles. So that's how you can um, access the data. 
And these are the data that are collected on board, uh, on board the um, airborne observation platform, which I just mentioned previously. And then you could use these data and compare them to um, the NASA products that we talked about last week. You can also download data from the PhenoCam network, um, such as these data products. These data include um, red, green, blue, and near infrared images of the plant canopy. And these are taken from an automated camera on the tower top. And we'll talk about this in more detail soon. The images are collected every 15 minutes and closely follow protocol for the PhenoCam network. And you can see here that the data are available continuously from 2016 to present. NEON also provides a variety of resources to support researchers, educators, and students who are using NEON data. And these include um, data tutorials, teaching modules, workshops, um, and science videos with information and communication pamphlets. So I do encourage you all to take a look at their um, additional available resources. So now, as promised, um, I've mentioned this a couple times now, um, we're going to discuss the PhenoCam network. The PhenoCam network is a cooperative continental scale phenological observatory that uses imagery from networked digital cameras to track vegetation phenology in a diverse range of ecosystems across North America, as well as around the world. So there are PhenoCam sites located um, in places that are not the US. So this is maybe of interest to you all who are not focused on the US. PhenoCam was established in 2008 and currently includes over 500 sites. The image archive includes over 30 million pictures and the imagery and data are made publicly available in near real time through their web page. Data from PhenoCam can be used for phenological model validation and development, evaluation of satellite remote sensing products, um, which we'll provide an example of um, during the next session. Um, it can be used for benchmarking Earth system models, studies of climate change impacts on terrestrial ecosystems. Unlike conventional remote sensing, near-surface remote sensing provides imagery that is continuous in time, free of contamination by clouds, and does not require correction of atmospheric effects like a lot of the satellite remote sensing data does. And this is a really large network of ground-based remote sensing cameras and is um, conducted by a large network of researchers at various universities, and, and some of those universities are listed here. PhenoCam was introduced to answer these important science questions. How do photo period, temperature, and precipitation govern phenological transitions in different vegetation types? How will phenology respond to climate change and what are the associated uncertainties? And how will these phenological shifts impact ecosystem processes and climate system feedbacks that are related to carbon and water? The digital camera component of, or the PhenoCam, serves as a bridge between comparatively coarse scale satellite remote sensing, like the the stuff we talked about last week, and the fine scale direct human observations of plant phenology, like those data entered into nature's notebook. Quantitative data on vegetation color is available in three wave bands or wavelengths, green, red, and blue. It can be extracted directly from the imagery and transformed into vegetation indices that are um, analogous to those used in satellite remote sensing. In a typical setup, a consumer grade digital camera is installed overlooking the vegetation of interest and set to record time-lapse images. The seasonality of those indices provide a direct measure of vegetation phenology and a means by which specific phenophase transition dates, such as the onset of green up or peak autumn color can be quantified. 
This analysis can be done separately for individual organisms or at the canopy level where um, you are integrating across multiple or um, multiple individuals or species. The canopy scale perspective is particularly valuable for contextualizing seasonal variation of ecosystem atmospheric fluxes of CO2 and other trace gases, as well as latent and sensible heat as measured by eddy covariance. The image on the right here gives you an example of how those phenochem data can help us create this holistic view in combination with those other um, data sets that I mentioned. Access to the data are free and you just have to register for an account at the website. Once you sign up, you'll be automatically sent an activation email. Once you've logged in, you can search using various filters such as site activity or primary vegetation type. Then you will see the filtered list of phenocams as indicated with a representative image of what the site looks like and um, includes the site's name and attributes. You can also search for a specific site using the map viewer shown here. Note that site activity is also indicated with green being active, yellow being inactive, and red being offline. When you zoom in closer to an area, you'll see a more accurate distribution of the sites as well. For example, you can zoom into Europe and then into Italy and click on one of these green dots. You can get the specific information about each site. So this one, um, like this one shown here. But this can help you explore a region of interest um, to see if there are any phenocam data available in your study area, for example. In the map interface, you can also filter by name, status, and primary vegetation type. So when you click on this specific site, you get more information about that site. This includes an image of the location and all the associated metadata like that shown um, here. You can also overlay the MODIS yearly land cover type over the Google Earth image. And that's what you can see here um, on the right. Here you can see that the area is mostly um, grassland. You can also view a time series of the site's daily Green Chromatic Coordinate, or GCC, which is a indice that's a measure of vegetation greenness. It's sort of a modified version of NDVI where you just use the red, green, and blue bands. Since many of the phenocam sites do not have the near infrared band, which is needed to calculate NDVI, the GCC is an alternative. And this is what you can see over multiple years for this site here in this figure. And this really presents a comparative approach for vegetation vigor or greenness. When you view the map online, you can also modify the time period of interest by moving the time slider along the bottom. And you can download these data um, as a figure like this or as a CSV. Additionally, if you click on the link along the top of the main site page, you can see the um, ancillary data from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center shown here. Here you can find subsets of MODIS and VIRS data for that same location where the phenocam measurements are taken. And these are available globally, so you can search for a specific site via this website shown here. Here you have many options to choose from such as the MODIS FPAR data sets that we talked about last week. If you click on a specific collection, you'll be taken to a page where you can download the data as a CSV or a JSON file. Again, um, for, the, um, for this DAC, you will need to have an Earth Data account to download data, but it's also free to register. You just have to sign up. Using this tool, you can also visualize time series of the data. For example, um, the image here on the top left is showing the MODIS 500 meter FPAR values throughout time. This is also dynamic and you can modify the time view directly on the website. You can also view the data in a gridded format, like 
like you can see here on the bottom right. Um, you can also play a GIF of monthly values for the region throughout time. So this presents a, a really great way to visualize the data for some initial investigation prior to downloading and doing your analysis. There are also many resources available for setting up your own PhenoCam and downloading and analyzing the um, products. Many of the data analysis tools are provided um, as coding, so you can access um, some image analysis features and, and um, functions through our Python and MATLAB packages. And those are also all available on GitHub. Again, there are also some additional educational resources and I've included the link for you all there. So to bring this all together, I wanted to mention a few other efforts that are working to span across these networks to pull together some of these data. So as we've discussed today, developing a solid understanding of how phenological activity interacts with the structure and function of ecosystems requires integrated information at multiple scales through time. So the next steps are really to connect these scales and types of data into an integrated system. So by facilitation and collaboration of these existing initiatives, there's an opportunity for improved understanding of ecological patterns and processes where we can do near real time phenological model modeling coupled with cross scale data. Um, and this can improve management of ecological systems, um, especially in the face of increasing climate variability and change. So here's where the advanced phenology information system comes together. I've already discussed parts of this network, um, like the R packages available on the NPN website. Connecting this work is really central to the Advanced Phenology Information System. And this is a project funded under NASA's Applied Sciences Ecological Forecasting Program. This acts as a model to improve discovery, accessibility, and usability of the phenological and ancillary um, data sets, such as the, the climate variables. Tools for data aggregation and integration will enable us to more effectively study these patterns. This also provides access to integrated field, tower, airborne, and multi-scale satellite time series. Um, all of those which we've discussed in this session as well as in the previous session. To create integrated tools, um, the team partnered with uh, conservation science partners and they've been working with the NPN as well as with NASA and the Earth Science community to create this system. Conservation Science Partners is a nonprofit collective established to meet the analytical and research needs of diverse stakeholders in conservation. And this really is an effort to connect the um, science to solve problems in a way that's comprehensive, flexible, and um, directly oriented at the needs of the community. One of the tools created by the um, conservation science partners is called DACRI, or Data Acquisitions and Retrieval Based Tool Set for Extracting Geospatial Data. Um, these include variables for phenological modeling from Google Earth Engine, given a set of point locations and parameters. Um, DACRI is designed to facilitate access to uh, many of the geospatial data sets by providing um, sort of a front-facing Google Earth Engine um, interface. One output from Daiquiri are figures for identifying the different data sets and when they're available for certain locations. So you can see this figure here identifies the acquisition dates for MODIS in yellow, um, MET in green, Landsat NDVI and EVI in blue, and DAMET data in purple. So you could use this as a tool to identify specific dates where you have data from all of these locations to start to do more analysis. And the tool, as well as all of the source code, can um, be accessed 
via this GitLab here. Phenosynth is another part of this effort, and it's an open repository R Shiny interface that addresses the need to overlap these different data types um, to spatially extract regions to continental scale phenology trends. And this was developed by researchers at Northern Arizona, as well as the USGS Fort Collins Science Center. It allows users to visualize and interact with phenological data across multiple sources. So it provides an interface to investigate the sort of apple to apples overlap in vegetation classification and evaluate agreement in phenological indices and time series across observational data sets. Um, this platform is still in development, but ultimately it will facilitate the multi-scale, multi-platform data integration. And this includes um, incorporation of PhenoCam as well as NEON data. So to summarize, there are extensive existing efforts to collect phenologically relevant information, including a range of data from in situ to near surface cameras and flux towers to airborne data, as well as the satellite imagery. There are also significant efforts to provide gridded historical and projected climate data. Um, there are many networks that we talked about today, such as NTNs, NEON, PhenoCam, and APIS. And the study and maturity of existing initiatives represent an opportunity for improved understanding of ecological patterns and processes. That real-time phenological monitoring, coupled with cross-scale data integration and modeling, can contribute to improved management of ecological systems. But there is still more work to do. Uh, cross-scale and cross-platform integration will require harmonization of protocols within and across platforms to enable this intercomparison and to facilitate the bridging uh, across scales from, say, individual plants to satellite pixels. And this integration will also require much coordination. So I want to thank you again for being with us today. We will have time for some questions. If I don't address your questions, you can also email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez. If you have general questions about RSET, you can email our program manager, Anna Prados. And I've also included the, the general RSET website where you can find all of our past training materials, as well as materials for different application areas like water resources. So please join us next week for our final session where we will provide some case studies to really illustrate this idea of multi-scale analysis and to highlight a lot of the data products and tools that we've discussed in the first two sessions. So now we'll have some time for questions. Please post them in the Q&A box and we will be going through a document that contains all the questions and answers, and we'll be posting that on the training website after the completion of this course. So thank you all. Hi everyone, uh, my apologies for the delay. Um, thank you all uh, for being with us today. Um, we have been answering some of these questions along the way, and um, I will go through um, some of them now as well. Okay, so the first question, is it possible to observe phen phenology without using remote sensing? And I, and I think this question came in a little um, early on during the um, presentation today. So um, yes, many of the networks that we covered in today's examples um, provide ground-based remote sensing um, networks that can be used for observing phenology. Um, so I would suggest getting started with um, some of those, um, such as the NPN and in particular Nature's Notebook. Okay, question two. How to plot coordination for getting information about certain location. 
So I'm not entirely sure what this question is asking. So if you could clarify, that would be really great. Um, depending on the software that you're using, for example, if you're interested in plotting site locations using a, Q, uh, a GIS system, you can um, create shapefiles using the coordinates of those, um, like the latitude and longitude of those point locations. Um, you could create an Excel file and then um, come on and um, create a, a point shape file for a QGIS or an ArcGIS system in order to identify those areas. And you could also um, include the data um, around um, those point locations within those files. Um, but it really depends on what system you're interested in using for this. Okay. Um, Next question, question three. Um, how highly constrained can some of these sensors be at assessing F par and par during wet, se wet or seasons? So F par, as we talked about during the last session, is the fraction of incoming solar energy absorbed through photosynthesis. And this is taken um, in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. And both the MODIS and VIRS products have been validated with ground-based information. Um, and I do know that the validation process has been conducted in various ecosystems, um, including, um, you know, uh, grasses, savanna, broadleaf, um, needleleaf forest, those types of things. Um, so I'm not familiar with uh, the extensive validation process and if they we're analyzing wet versus dry systems and looking over seasons. I, I would imagine that they, they did this, um, but I've included the link there for the documentation on the um, validation process for those data sets as well. Okay, question four. I'm working on tracking phenological changes on cereals in Europe. If I'm working with a single band in indices, is there a way to rescale the values of the indices to match the reflectance values of single bands that normally go from zero to positive values? So I think I need a little bit more information about this to answer this question. Um, and some clarification on the bands and indices that you are using um, and what you'd like to compare them to. Um, in session three, in the next session, we will talk about comparisons of NDVI and EVI from VIRS and um, two other indices. Um, from using the PhenoCam network, as we talked about today, um, PhenoCam in, in some locations only takes images uh, with cameras that have red, green, blue. So there are some um, indices that uh, can be created using the ratios of red, green, blue, if you do not have the near infrared on your, on your camera. Um, and those are the green chromatic coordinate, GCC, and the vegetation contrast index, or VCI. And um, so we'll talk about these comparisons next session. We have a few different case study examples. Um, so we will go through some of those as well. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not aware of any um, comparisons that are made with just a single band, um, but you can um, create these similar ratios, as I mentioned. Okay, question five. What are specific parameters of phenology data required while nature is changing and how does it take the phenology data? <clears throat> so I think that this really depends on the system you're interested in. So you could compare leaf out um, of certain trees, for example, to NDVI um, and identify those as markers of, say, the start of a season. Um, or you could identify ground-based information that shows um, leaf color changing and NDVI decreasing that could, could be related to the end of the season. Um, so it really depends on the ecosystem you're interested in and if those parameters can be evaluated 
via remote sensing. And if the area is large enough um, for satellite remote sensing, especially to have a homogeneous representation of the changes that are, are being um, um, made on the ground. Um, so we will also, as I mentioned, um, discuss this in session three, so stay tuned. Um, okay, question five, is NPN global? No. This question came up a few times and um, I, do, I did mention in the, the presentation that many of these systems that we are talking about for this training are only for the US. Phenocam is the exception. It has um, sites uh, more globally. I do know that there is an extensive network of Phenocam in Europe. Um, and there's also a European phenology network uh, that, that it, um, has similar data available. But the, N, the NPN is just for um, the US. Question seven. I wanted to know if the accumulated heat you showed in your presentation was measured with ground station or using remotely sensed data such as the thermal infrared band of the sensor mounted in the Landsat 8 mission. So for the accumulated heat via um, the um, NPN network, those, are, uh, those values are obtained from multiple different uh, modeled products. And I've listed those here. Those include data from NOAA, the National Weather Service, as well as the, the PRISM model. Um, and, and I've included the link here for more information on those products. So they are not um, using the Landsat 8 thermal um, bands, but they are using these um, sort of gridded uh, climatological products that I've mentioned there. Um, question eight, similar to question six, are the spring indices or AGDD global maps? Um, no, those are also just um, for the US. Um, all the uh, maps available on the NPN are only for the US. Okay, question nine. Can you please explain what exactly is phenophase? Um, so phenophases are shifts in the timing of reoccurring plant and animal life cycle stages. Um, so these phenophases or shifts uh, will uh, really vary depend, depending on um, the ecosystem and the um, species you're interested in. So these could include things like leaf bud burst, first flower, fruits, or leaf off events. Um, and these are really related to the environmental conditions. And we talked about this during the first session quite a bit. Um, and it, it, for example, um, in particularly warm and dry spring, the phenophases might occur earlier or um, later in a cool and wet spring. Um, and this, again, really depends on the ecosystem of interest. And they, they, um, the phenophase um, timing of these phenophases really depends on patterns of weather and climate um, variability. Okay, so question 10. This is a really interesting question that I can't answer. Um, is there any problem studying study pertaining to human annual animal conflict in forest regions? Um, I'm sure there are, this is not my area of expertise. So if we do have any researchers online with us right now who work in this area, feel free to share some of these resources. Um, and if you can offer any examples of this type of work. Um, so my apologies, that, that's, that's not my area of, of, of research there. Okay, question 11. In the slide, you mean that NEON works with US American data compared with that from the rest of America. And I think the answer is yes to that. Um, the NEON data are available only for the continental US. Um, they have a core of 20 sites across the US and a total of 81 um, sites that include the um, aquatic and terrestrial sites. And those sometimes change. Um, and um, may have been uh, only available for certain time periods that the, the network has been online. Um, and uh, those span over 20 ecosystems across the US. 
And um, on slide 31 of today's presentation, um, we have a, a figure of, of what that, what, where those locations are. Um, so you can get more information there. Okay, uh, what is the baseline or normal period for determining the anomalies for the NPN spring indices? So question 12 here. The baseline climatology for um, most of the anomaly calculations is 1981 to 2010. So you have that um, sort of 30 year climatology, which is a very standard uh, use across um, these types of studies. Okay, question uh, 13. Does NEON data portal support to create localized biodiversity hub for a small region, say 200 hectares? So the NEON data are ground-based are ground sensors. So they are towers that collect the localized information. So if the site is located in a region that you're interested in studying, um, then certainly the NEON data could be used in conjunction with any type of biodiversity research that you are conducting. Um, so, so they are localized um, data that can be used for other studies as well. Um, okay. So question 14, do the NEON data portal, oh, this is similar to the rest. Do um, the, the, the NPN visualization tool also have data from outside the US? No, so those are um, all available only within the US. Okay, question 15. Um, in the NEON portal, is it available for CO2 flux data <clears throat> as well? Um, okay, so uh, the answer to that is yes, I think um, all the NEON towers are collecting CO2 flux data, at least the um, 20 um, sites that are um, the core sites. Um, you can search for all the data products for each of the towers using the Explore Data Products site, and I've included that site. Um, here um, at the bottom of the answer for question 15. And um, looks like one of my colleagues is, is um, continuing to answer question 14 where um, by, by showing some of these examples from these large scale um, national networks within the US, um, the hope is that it can be um, used for examples and ideas for doing this type of research elsewhere as well. Um, and I'm sure there are other networks that are um, collecting this kind of information across the world. We're just not highlighting them here. <clears throat> okay. I'm gonna skip question 16 and come back to that and try to answer that um, later on. So question 17. What is the extent geographic coverage of NEON's airborne data for each ecological domain? So the, the aircraft, as we mentioned, is collecting gridded LIDAR data at one meter spatial resolution and some digital photography at 0.25 meter resolution. Um, each year, NEON conducts these flights over 75% of their field sites. And the flight box, it ranges depending on the site, but it's between 100 and 300 um, square kilometers. And I've also included the link there for more information about the airborne uh, remote sensing um, flights and campaigns for each of the sites. Okay, question 18. Is it possible to join the PhenoCam project and include sites for other countries? Yeah, that is a great question. And yes, um, they are actively looking for collaborators. Um, and it, it seems like you can join with uh, just a few uh, specific parameters. Um, if you can contribute the camera imagery um, and uh, make those available publicly, they, uh, the PhenoCam network will archive it, process it, and, um, and get the, the data out there. Uh, if you take a look at question three on the PhenoCam FAQ, I've included the link to that um, there in the question. Um, you can find it, more information on the specifics of how you do this and get connected to the group. 
<clears throat> I'm going to skip um, question 19. The question is, in addition to the images collected on the website, is there data labeled for individuals in the community? I'm not quite sure what this question is asking. If if the um, phenocam or the neons, if the phenocam data are uh, marking individual species, like individual tree stands, um, and taking information on those, I'm I'm not quite sure what this question is asking. So if you could clarify it, we'll try to um, get back to it um, before we post the questions to the website. Oh, and the questions are also available um, from session one on the website now, too, as a reminder. Okay. Um, have there been cases where atmospheric conditions may affect the phenocam data on site? Now, in my exploration of the data and the websites, not that I'm aware of, um, but I can imagine some cases where, for example, fog may be affecting the ability of the phenocam data to collect the imagery. Um, so this might be a case-by-case -case basis, and I'm sure there's documentation about this if that is the case for any of these. Um, but, but that's sort of the beauty of the phenocam data is that there's, there's not really the need for the atmospheric correction like you need to do for the um, satellite remote sensing data. It's a great question, though. Made me think. Um, we will not cover question 21 um, in regards to reflectance of saline soils. Um, that's not really the topic of interest here for the um, training, but um, sorry, I cannot help you there with that one. Um, okay, uh, question 22 is very specific, <laughs> um, so I'm not sure I can answer it entirely either. Um, but how the question is, how affected does seed or, or germ plasm production have with respect to the effects of climate change and phenology in each year for the pinus species coupled with the seed years of each species? Um, what about the pinus species that have good production every five to six years? Can this be noticeable in some way using these various indices and which has the most precision? I'm not familiar with the specific species, um, but a few um, points of guidance I can offer. It really depends on the on the the growth of the plant, the greenness of the plant, how the greenness and that sort of that spectral signature of the data of the um, plant within the remote sensing data would compare to these ground based very specific changes that you're seeing um, in terms of seed production. Um, and, and so in order to compare uh, these larger scale uh, uh, remote sensing products to the ground-based information, there, you have to be able to sort of see um, the, the, these shifts over large regions um, and they have to be related to the, the greenness of the plant. Um, so you're not going to be able to see much about seed production unless that's also related to um, some of the spectral properties of the plant itself. Um, so do uh, take into consideration the spatial distribution. The, um, is it a, uh, a really large stand of, of the species? Um, and you know how that would compare to the spatial resolution of something like remote sensing data. Um, so I can't be very specific on that, that answer, but um, there are some things to consider when, when pairing remote sensing data with ground-based information like seed production. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those next week um, as well. Okay, um, would you suggest camera make and specifications for initiating phenocam studies. Um, yes, yeah, so, so do please, this is related to question 18. I have not operated a phenocam network myself, um, so I can't give you the specifics for uh, the camera that you would use, but there are specifics on the phenocam website um, where you can get more information of how to join the community. And there's also a uh, an in, a, a document there that they link to that is a like a 
a getting started document that has those um, suggestions on the types of cameras that you could use for those studies. <clears throat> okay. Um, can we use PhenoCam data, question 24, can we use PhenoCam data in corporate companies for creating a sample case study for users? Or is the data only available for academic research? I believe that the data are freely available to anyone. Um, do please check on the uh, website for the data use policy. Um, that might uh, identify uh, who can use the data and how to cite the data. Uh, generally, I think for most of these networks, so long as you're citing the data appropriately within your work, um, it's freely available to anyone. So um, do please check on that. <clears throat> okay. Question 25. Um, uh, regarding the time series presented on slide 53, is the ROI a pixel or a region? So this is an area of interest that contains many pixel, pixels from PhenoCam, um, as an example. And you can get that specific information on the um, size of the area um, from the um, PhenoCam website. But the um, PhenoCam data are um, have high, very high spatial resolution. So the, the example I provided was a region of many pixels for PhenoCam. Um, this may be only one pixel of a satellite image, um, but, but it contains many um, pixels from the PhenoCam. Um, is there, question 26, is there any API to load NEON or other data products? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that you can download the NEON data um, via the, the portals that we've outlined here. I'm not sure if you can include your own data and upload them to the NEON portal itself. Um, so you'd have to check on, on their website. Um, I, I believe that the, all the NEON data are um, contained within the website and, and pushed out. I don't believe they host any other kind of data on there. Okay. 4 study of small farms, which platform is best? Well, this really depends, again, on um, where your small farms may be and um, if they are covered by some of these site locations. Um, you know, the, the NPN has a, a really extensive network across the US, um, so that might be the first place to start. Um, and it might just be a matter of uh, identifying your particular study area um, and then going online and seeing um, where there are data available for that region within these different networks. Um, it also might depend on what questions you have about small farms. Um, I would, you know, I would recommend the uh, ground-based networks if the region is really small, and and um, certainly the the PhenoCam and the Neon data would be more applicable to smaller regions, um, as we we do often see um, issues with the large-scale remote sensing data. You know, even at 30 meters of Landsat, sometimes that can be too large to get one value for a small uh, farm. So oftentimes the satellite remote sensing data um, has some real limitations for those regions. Um, so it, it really just might depend um, on, on, the, uh, on the region of interest. Question 28, a uh, great question. Is FetoCam data available for Indian regions? I'm not sure. Um, I would imagine with the extensive PhenoCam data um, network available that these, some of these do include um, indigenous lands um, across the US. Um, I would recommend 
going to the PhenoCam website and doing a search using the mapping tool to um, identify the regions uh, that may be um, uh, of interest to you um, to see if there are any PhenoCam data available in, in um, indigenous and tribal lands across the, the US. Um, Ah, uh, question 29, um, related to a previous question, not sure what number that was, um, but have there been cases where atmospheric conditions may affect the phenocam data, such as smog, fog, rain, et cetera? Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll reference that previous question, but um, it's a great question, um, and I'm not particularly aware of any of this research being done, but I can imagine there being instances where um, these types of variables would affect the phenocam data. Uh, question 30, wasn't APIS extended beyond 2020? I'm not sure if that project has been um, funded for an extension. I know that the, um, the, the folks involved with that uh, group have been working really diligently um, to wrap up some of their uh, project outcomes. Um, so that might be a question specifically for um, some of the leaders of that group, I'm thinking of um, Jeff Morissette potentially <clears throat> could help answer that question. I'm not sure um, the specifics of the, the funding um, of that, that project. Okay. I think we'll go for just a couple more minutes. Um, and then if there are questions we don't get to, um, as we did with session one, we'll come back and answer those within the document and post them to the website later. I know we are um, quite a bit over time, but there are some really quick, great questions here that I think um, have value um, to answer. So uh, maybe we'll do a couple more and uh, we'll, we'll wrap up in at, at, the, um, at 9.30 Pacific time. Wherever you are, we'll wrap up at the... Um, 30 mark of the hour. So question 31, does NPN include data on croplands, grasslands, and rangelands? Yes. Um, so the, the NPN network um, is really extensive and there are data available across a wide range of ecosystems. Um, there, there are maps available of where some of these measurements are taken. Um, you can look through uh, nature's notebook to identify specific regions of interest. Uh, we will provide some examples of um, NPN uh, maps and visualization available through um, their visualization tool. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Um, but yes, they, they are available on a wide variety of ecosystems and and I would encourage anyone to get involved with that group um, and become a contributor. Um, if, if you have data, um, if you're, you're collecting information on these types of ecosystems and want to become a member of Nature's Notebook, it's freely available to anyone um, so long as you can collect, um, I believe they ask for weekly measurements for a particular region. Um, so, so do please check the, the NPN network for how to get involved if you're interested in some of um, these ecosystems and in, including data. Question 32, does the daiquiri only include data from the US? I believe so, yes. Um, again, um, that is a tool that is including the NPN um, phenology uh, Phenocam um, neon networks. Um, I do know that part of Daiquiri is also looking at when data are available from a variety of sources. So comparing things like um, when you can find a Landsat image at the same time as a Phenocam image or a leaf area index product. Um, 
So some of those products are available globally, but I do think that the um, Daiquiri tool focuses primarily on um, many of the US systems as well. And I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure there. Okay. Question 33 is a long one. Okay. Uh, when we calculated vegetation indices, NDVI, using radiance data acquired from tower-based observations, how could we detect the range of wavelengths for suitable bands? For example, when we want to calculate NDVI, we may need a red or near infrared. From the tower-based observation, there are many wavelengths showing spike-like radiance at high resolution data. It's difficult to decide from which wavelength to which wavelength is suitable for red band or near infrared band. Are there any rules for that? So I would say, um, as I mentioned previously, we will provide some example. We'll provide one example in particular where um, a group of researchers looked at phenocam data alongside VIRS data. And you know, as the this question is, I think mentioning. Uh, Sometimes the uh, the data from, say, the Phenochem network and the remote sensing data um, aren't collecting information in the same wavelengths, um, such as the near infrared. Many of the cameras don't include the near infrared band. Um, so there are alternatives. There are alternative uh, indices that are used um, that only include the uh, visible bands, such as the blue, green, green red. Um, so essentially looking at um, the ratio of, for example, red versus green, as opposed to red versus near infrared, which we use with NDVI from the satellite imagery. Um, so there, there are some alternatives to comparing um, different types of imagery across different wavelengths. Um, and we'll talk about that next week. Um, so I hope that sort of gets to that question a bit. Okay, let's do one more <laughs> and then we'll close for the day. Um, and I know there are many other questions here, um, but we'll, we'll uh, get to these questions and answer them in the document and then um, provide them online to you all afterwards. So, okay, last question, 34. Can we register the Phenocam images to the ground coordinates that, so that we can easily correlate with satellite images? That's a great question. And yes, um, all the uh, Phenocam data have coordinates associated with the data. So they have like a latitude, longitude. Um, there's also a great feature for, for uh, many of the Phenocam sites where um, once you go to the particular site details and information, um, you can then um, click on a link that takes you to comparisons of um, the, the gridded VIRS data alongside the Phenocam data. And that takes you, I believe, to LPDAC. And within LPDAC, you can see side by side the Phenocam data and the satellite imagery. So you can download the specific region of interest from the satellite image where your Phenocam data are. And I think this is available for most of the Phenocam sites. I noticed it on some of the work I was doing. Um, but that's a great way to really ensure that you're you're looking at the same area when you're comparing the Phenocam data to, say, the VIRS data. That's a really good question. All right, everyone. Um, well, we will go ahead and wrap up for today. I really appreciate all these questions and your engagement. Um, and it's great to see such a large community um, across the world engaging in um, these, these questions and these, these trainings. So um, we have one more session, so please do come back.
next week where we'll dive in a little deeper and um, talk about some case study examples of research using the um, multi-scalar analysis of ground-based and remote sensing data. So, so do please tune in ne next week and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.